其实很难说是从哪儿，就是从哪儿看。I paint what I feel. Simplicity is power. I like strong contrast. The light seems to glow from behind the canvas. I like to solidify light and color so they hold weight and volume, rather than just fleeting eye catchers. Light and color come from the heart of the artist. All my paintings are done in the studio. First, of course, you need to know what you are doing. You need to be clear in what you're trying to present in your work. The original motive of each painting may be very different. Sometimes it could be a seemingly complete composition. Sometimes it could be some kind of atmosphere. Sometimes it's a certain color combination, and sometimes it's a certain interesting detail. Whatever they are, I need to put them together in a way I'm happy with. I do sketches, tons of them. On three by five index cards. The benefit of these sketches is that I can quickly develop and grasp the whole structure, including colors. To me, the most important element in a painting is its major structure. It decides how smoothly the following work will go, or how successfully I am able to present what I intend to do. Then it's ready to go on the canvas. I carefully transfer the structure of the composition onto the canvas. Sometimes there are only a few lines, depending on the need to precisely divide the canvas. Then I'll let it sit, look at it, and readjust. My next step is to use a large brush to cover the whole canvas with paint. Usually, I start with the most basic color to set the primary tone of the painting. Other colors will evolve from that. I gradually build up a set of color relationships that I'm happy with. At this stage, I usually work as fast as I can. It helps me express my freshest feelings about color and the overall atmosphere of the painting. My paintings are built up by layers. By doing so, I can achieve the special effects of oil painting that I want. I'll paint layer after layer, enrich it with more details, more refined brush strokes, keep strengthening the expressiveness so unique to oil paint. I must say, in this process, the painting seems to take a life of its own. It grows by itself, giving me lots of surprises. But sometimes it could also be extremely painful, making you just want to kill it. Oil painting to me is far from just filling the canvas with color, but to discover the life and power of painting in the process. You observe it, feel it, and explore it. These are a must. Then it seems suddenly. It's time to stop. It's gotten there. What you intend to express are pretty much all there, with some surprise and some remorse. Whenever possible, I hang the painting in my studio for some time, letting time tell me if there's something else I want to do with it. Then it's signed. I feel the painting process is not like working on a printing press; it's more like riding a horse. <laughs>这个、I was born and raised in Beijing, China. It's a big urban city in Asia. I felt it was the city from George Orwell's novel, 1984. <laughs> The Chinese Cultural Revolution started when I was eight years old. The whole country went through a great deal of turmoil. The schools were closed, and my parents were rarely home. I wasn't interested in any of the Red Guards' activities. Therefore, painting became my sanctuary. My father loved art. He painted traditional Chinese paintings, so it was natural for me to start painting to fill all the free time I had. I think my parents were happy about that too. They were already in deep trouble. Painting at home would keep me out of trouble. I wonder if that made my father feel that I identified with him. Then I just keep painting. 
unconsciously walking down the path to become an artist. It was my way to escape the reality, the turmoil of society and enter my own world. Nothing bothered me anymore. It was fun. I think even to today I don't regret it. Painting has brought me a lot of joy. Of course, slowly I learned that the art world also brought me a lot of worries. And now to think of it, I've been traveling on bumpy roads. As we all know, in the days of communist China, art is a form of political propaganda. The standards for art were non-art. I think it's universal that young people are rebellious, and a lot of times pressure could be motivation. Looking back, I think we had some fun. However, I do not wish upon myself or today's young artists to go through what we've been through. After I graduated from Central Academy of Art and Design, I was assigned to a designer job at a state-owned company, manufacturing traditional oriental rugs. My tapestry weaving art period started in 1984, a few years into China's economic reform. I must mention a French artist, Juan Man, Myron Varbanov. He was my mentor and a dear friend. He was a legend himself. He moved back to Beijing because his wife, Sung Waigui, was the rep for Pierre Cardin in China. We met him merely by coincidence. He came to our studio to work every day. Then we would go drinking at the bars after work. He opened up a completely different window for us, to art and to life. To me, the Western world was no longer abstract symbols in the book, but a lively reality. He was not only an artist of quality, but also a person of quality. His picture has a permanent spot on my desk. In 1986 and 1987, we had two exhibitions of our abstract tapestry art in the China National Museum of Fine Arts in Beijing. We called it soft sculpture. In the 1986 exhibition, I used traditional tapestry materials like wool and hemp. The exhibition the following year, I first weaved with Chinese rice paper, then applied Chinese ink on the surface. These were the very first Chinese abstract art exhibited at the National Museum. Back in the 80s in China, abstract art was still the symbol of decadent bourgeois art. We argued that our works were just weaving craft without any concern of being politically correct. However, our studio was dismissed after only our second exhibition. These exhibitions were very well received and brought a lot of attention, including Mrs. Bickford, who was married to the head of the Weyerhaeuser office in Beijing. She contacted the Davidson Gallery in Seattle on my behalf, and they started showing my work when I was still in Beijing. This was my first connection to the United States. Not too long after that, Centrum was organizing a Washington State Centennial Artist Exchange Program. They invited 10 artists from Pacific Rim countries, paired with 10 local artists for an art exchange and exhibition. I was very fortunate to be invited to come to Seattle, and I ended up staying, making a new life in the Pacific Northwest. I also visited New York City, DC, and LA to attend art events see some friends and visit the museums I've long admired. It gave me great satisfaction, but it was anticipated satisfaction. Zizi moves to a new country, doesn't speak the language. Uh, he has a freedom to express himself, which he didn't have there. He was forced to do uh, nationalistic or patriotic art and coming to America, and being exposed to, number one, the ability to do whatever the hell you wanted to do, and being in a region where the sky in Seattle's pretty blue too, and things are pretty upbeat and pretty happy. Compared to China, I think it was just an eye-opening, wow, now ZZ can become ZZ. When I moved to Walla Walla, it gave me a completely different living environment and a different feeling about life. 
I learned how to drive and bought my very first car, a beat-up 1982 Mercury Capri. Every day it took me drifting up and down all the winding back roads in the Palouse. Sometimes I had the illusion that it's the road taking me floating through the wheat fields, through those farms and barns, through the tunnels of time and space. The feelings were multiplied, complicated, and brand new to me. There were surprises, desolate freedom and loneliness. It reminded me of what Gauguin wrote on one of his paintings. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? I didn't know, but I knew transformation had begun. In fact, Walla Walla is not some famous tourist attraction or wonders of nature or mankind. It's ordinary, just as ordinary as the country life that people tend to ignore. But I know that under the ordinary, there lies tremendous power. The nature and the people living there do not give much refinement to the landscape. Instead, it inspires me with the contrast of big patches of colors and forms, rolling hills, all are powerful and yet peaceful. All these resonate with me and give me all the freedom to compose on my canvas. That's what I think the nature-human relationship is. I wanted to paint the landscape. I didn't care about all the noise in my head and what I've learned from art history, art theory, and all the art techniques. I bought some very basic oil materials, some mat boards cut into 16 by 20 inch pieces. Then every day I would drive out as far as I could into the country and then came back to paint it. like the vertiginous sense you get of these rolling hills and these, these ro winding roads that dip down out of sight and then reappear on the next hill. On some of the Pacific Coast paintings, there's a sense that you might really fall off the road into the ocean if you aren't careful. There's a really strong sense of the landscape being alive. But clearly the Palouse inspires the yellow. And I think the blue is inspired by the clarity of the sky in the Palouse. Uh, I think those are the colors he sees. I think they're the colors that register to his artistic instincts. Zizi's artwork is very expressive, it's very intuitive. Um, he's gone from kind of a more whimsical, tightly rendered, tightly composed body of work to intuitive brushwork, a lot of movement, a lot more abstraction. The work itself, I don't want to pigeonhole it into being one thing because I think there's a lot of things that have influenced it over the years. I would say that if I had to pick an idea, it would be expressionism with some hints of the surreal and some hints of impressionism in it. What drew my wife and I to his art right at the beginning was just the color, the clarity of it. I know this is a kind of an interesting way to think about it, but it caused us to smile kind of automatically. Uh, even the little cars that you see through a lot of his work. It was just immediate connection because of the color and the pop that you got and, and the smile that went along with it. In describing Zizi's color palette, it's dictated by the area in which he's rendering. And when he started painting the Pacific Northwest, the colors were new to him. The colors of the wheat fields were just beautifully golden. In the springtime, they were very, very green, a green color to which he'd never seen before. The contrast of those colors against the beautiful sky, casting the long afternoon shadows. Where he started with all of this in the Pacific Northwest is where his colors began. He 
seems to have an inordinate fondness for rust, <laughs> rust, rust textures wearing themselves down. He does seem kind of interested in the erosion of human artifact against this landscape. Almost none of the buildings are, or cars that he depicts are in terribly good shape. I don't think Zizi is looking for new ways to say things. I think uh, he, he sees the car not so much as a car, but as an object, as a piece of the composition. There's never a very modern vehicle in those paintings. It's the same rusty red car, you know, plowing its way through the wheat fields. And yet it doesn't feel like an exercise in nostalgia at all. It feels a little bit like a dream vision. You almost get the feeling that he is this car and he's traveling this landscape. And sometimes he, as the car, kind of becomes one with the landscape. I think he pulls the viewer into his painting that way, too. I think that broken down car is me. <laughs> I'm not a symbolist, but it seems to have become a symbol of my work. That's something I didn't expect. When I was in Walla Walla, I had my first car. It was not only an instrument for everyday life, but also a part of me. It helped me, protects me, wandering aimlessly in the Palouse every day. It took me to explore and understand this unfamiliar new world. Now to think of it, it might have great impact on my painting style. Driving at the speed of 55 miles per hour, you don't notice all the detail. Only the large forms, strong colors and light leave an impression. And when you're moving at the high speed, your vision seems to retain the impressions from different places and composes a new image in your brain. Wow, great. Now I realize that car helped me find my artistic style. Is this a story? I don't know. Maybe it's true? I think new cars are industrial products. No, personality. But when they die, they each have a different story, a different appearance, and it becomes a characteristic of their life. They are there to witness the human life, just like the roads, the barns, and other things I paint. I rarely paint pure nature. I'm much more interested in the relationship between man and nature. I think he uses his shadows brilliantly as a major element in the design of the painting. They are the first thing you're almost aware of when you look at the painting because they're so black. That contrast between the barn or the wheat. And I think because he does use it as such a major element, it appears very pronounced in every painting. The shadows actually are light. It's the yin and yang that the Chinese talk about. They are a whole, the basics of the universe. The light and shadows in my paintings are the most important elements. I like to paint them as if they are solid. What I mean is, when you knock on them, you seem to hear the echo. Light and shadow carve the land and the barns, crawling over the landscape. They are not the light and shadow I see in nature. They are the light and shadow in my heart. Cece's brushwork is interesting and it's interesting because of the materials that he uses and he does not go to tremendous expense in either buying canvases, brushes, paints, any of the common things that an artist would use to create these paintings. I use these brushes because I'm poor. <laughs> 
这个这个是一个。不过 I feel maybe I'm used to basic brushes. I think they're handy and suit my skills. Or I should say that I have to develop some skills in the way I work to utilize these tools. To be honest, I haven't really thought about it. I feel at ease while using them. I think that the way you work is related to what you want to achieve on your work. The materials don't have much influential results. I think probably if he painted with his thumb, he could do the same, get the same effect. I think the brush merely transports the paint to the canvas. It doesn't become a tool for making fine, fine edges or blurring edges together that require a certain kind of a brush. I just don't think it's an issue with him. I think the style of his painting lends itself so well to a big, bold, direct slash. He doesn't noodle the things. I don't care too much about tools. I care about the end results. Sometimes I feel if I have to, I can paint with chopsticks. <laughs> yeah. He often, in his work, you'll see signs. Most of them are road signs, so they're anticipating a curve or a stop, and many of them clearly with bullet holes or other, other damage and rust to it. Um, it goes back, I think, uh, as well to, to the smile that it draws out of people. You immediately can think back having seen something like that in your driving around. I've never seen another artist quite use that. I mean, the little cars, the shade, the signs, not in every piece that he does, but if you look at his work over time, you'll see that pop up pretty regularly. When I paint landscapes, I purposely limit my subject matter. I don't want them to become postcards of different attractions. The way I treat the subjects in my paintings, like cars, barns, and roads, is like how portrait artists treat their subjects. I want to depict different environments and their different personalities. I want to paint them as portraits of nature. As he's ventured out of the Northwest and started to paint some other areas, we've seen his color palette change and evolve. For instance, he did a series on Alaska after having visited there, and the color palette of the Alaska pieces were quite different in that the undertones were mostly blues and grays and not the yellow ochres and the golden tones that we found from eastern Washington. He went to the desert southwest and started doing some pieces that were more akin to those colors and those palettes. Travel is part of my life and part of my creative process. It's the most basic foundation of my art. There are two parts, actually. One is looking outward, the other is looking into your heart. You might paint what you see, like some of my paintings of Alaska and Santa Fe, but some I'll never get to paint. The most important part is the spirit behind my paintings. The spiritual elements are universal. The subject matter is just the means I choose for expression. He took off relatively quickly, and as he became more known, many times it was a sellout. Literally every piece that was produced for a particular show was a sellout. He wasn't producing at that time in the same volume. Some of that may have helped create the demand. We started having yearly shows with him starting in 1993. And in about 1998, we noticed that we were getting 30 or 40 paintings in, and we'd have about 200 people on a waiting list wanting to collect those paintings and started to having to draw names for them so that we could put them into more hands than just one person. I don't think he 
seeks international fame. I really don't. I don't put him in the same category as a Jeff Koons or Damien Hurst or, you know, the guys that are selling hundred million dollar stuff. I like ZZ's work better than either of those two guys. I think he's happy being what he is. Usually there is a genre for artwork, but his seems to cross a lot of boundaries, and I think that that's really interesting. And as somebody that's been in the art business for all my life, but 30 years professionally, you don't often find that in collectors. You find them, I only like Impressionism, or I only collect etchings, or whatever it is they collect. But ZZ's work fits into a lot of different collections, and I think it's because he really fits into a lot of people's lives. I think one of the great things in what has happened to ZZ Way's career is the level of respect for his art even outside the United States, much less outside the Northwest. I think it's fun that he is a Northwest artist. I think all of us should feel good about that. Clearly his work is appreciated in a lot of areas around the country and around the world. Zizi is an internationally collected artist at this point. One of those areas is New York and San Francisco and Santa Fe. We have placed paintings in Europe as well as Eastern Europe. Australia and New Zealand as well. There's a consistency of style that is not forced, it's not flavor of the month, it's a ZZ way look that's been consistent for his whole career. And I think evidence of the consistency is that he can paint New Mexico as well as he can paint the Palouse. And I'm convinced he could paint New York City as well and still look like a ZZ way. I think what's most important is that the whole body of my work is a narrative, to tell a more interesting story. Of course, each painting is telling something different. But art is my lifelong vocation, and that's the story I truly want to tell. Sometimes I think of myself, a Chinese man who comes to America and paints the American landscape. It doesn't quite fit into the art philosophy. Maybe it's more interesting than any story I can tell in my paintings. almost 60 years old. I don't know. I hope I'm still a kid, but I'm almost 60. Though everything is still possible, I just keep going. The Leonard Cohen song, Dance Me to the End of Love, just came to mind. That's fitting. Love.